Good evening. Welcome to our first Conversations That Matter of 2023. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, National Chair of A Women's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine's A Women's Journey, thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Conversations That Matter. A Woman's Journey strives to improve your well being through health education. According to Johns Hopkins Medicine, an arrhythmia is an abnormality in the timing or pattern of the heartbeat. When you have an arrhythmia, your heart may beat too quickly or too slowly, or you may experience an irregular rhythm in which your heart feels as if it is skipping a beat. While some types of arrhythmia may not be serious, other types may be of great concern because they can cause fainting, heart failure, or even sudden death. Tonight, we are joined by cardiologist, Dr. Hugh Calkins, who serves as director of the Cardiac Arrhythmia Service at Johns Hopkins. So please use the Q&A on the screen to ask your questions to the doctor who will respond during the last 20 minutes of tonight's conversation, which will conclude at 8 p.m. I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for their production assistance. And you can visit their website for additional lecture, lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Calkins. Welcome. Great. Well, thanks, Kelly, and thank you, thank you all of you for taking part of your evening to spend uh, with me and learn about heart arrhythmia as a condition which I find to be extremely fascinating. Now, uh, here's my relationships with industry. So I can I have to begin, of course, with this, the story of uh, Lamar, uh, the the famous uh, uh, the Buffalo Bills football player who collapsed about a week ago, uh, exactly a week ago during a football game. And I think some of you may have watched it. Many of you heard about it. You certainly have heard about it on the news. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, so I certainly was very interested in this. And, and he obviously uh, collapsed and had a cardiac arrest on the field. Now, I think it's important to realize what a cardiac arrest is. A cardiac arrest results from ventricular fibrillation. It's not a heart attack. It's an arrhythmia of the lower chamber of the heart where the lower chamber of the heart suddenly starts beating 600, 800 beats a minute so fast that blood can't be pumped effectively to the body. No blood flow to the body. You pass out. You pass out. And there's no blood flow. If you don't intervene, then you, uh, then you die from that condition. Now, sudden cardiac death is remarkably common. It happens 300,000 times each year in the United States, where every minute we have our lecture tonight, one person experiences sudden cardiac death. Now, most patients who have a cardiac arrest have underlying heart disease, with coronary disease, blocked arteries being the most common underlying cause. In some patients, it's the first manifestation of heart disease. They may have had coronary artery disease, but they didn't know it until they had a cardiac arrest, were resuscitated, hopefully, and it was picked up on evaluation. It can also occur in patients who don't have structural disease, who have a totally normal heart structurally, but they have an electrical abnormality. And the treatment of, of a sudden cardiac death starts with CPR. You Someone passes out, you check their pulse. There's no pulse, you start CPR, you get an AED, and you shock them as quickly as possible because if they're in ventricular fibrillation, the only effective treatment is delivering a shock to the chest that resynchronizes the heartbeat and then the patient wakes up. And that's the case that happened with uh, Lamar. Now, in his case, he, did, he had a cardiac arrest due to a condition called comodio cordis. And this is a condition that has been discovered decades ago. It's actually fairly well known in, in among arrhythmia experts and cardiologists. But if something hits your chest at a high speed at exactly the wrong timing, and this is a little schematic of a, of a sort of a CT scan of the chest, and here's the heart hitting it, sitting in your chest. This is your back, your sternum. So the back is here, your chest is here. So if you get hit most classically with a hockey buck or a lacrosse ball right over your heart, it's exactly the wrong time. 
that can induce VF. And this is an example, a normal beat, a normal beat. You get hit in the chest with a lacrosse ball or a soccer ball, not a soccer ball, a baseball, and instantly you're in VF. And you can see the heart is beating six, 800 beats a minute. You can barely count how fast these impulses are. The heart's just quivering like a bag of worms. And if you don't get in there and give that shock to the chest, the patient's going to die from this condition. Now, fortunately, they did good CPR. They got in there with a defibrillator quick, and now he's back in Buffalo recovering. So back to the overall challenge I was given a topic, the secret and not so secret signs of a cardiac arrhythmia signs and symptoms. So what I'm going to do tonight is first, I'm going to review the types of symptoms you can get from an arrhythmia. And then I'm going to give you a review of cardiac arrhythmias as if you're a medical student or you're learning about or a patient, and we're trying to explain what cardiac arrhythmias are. And then I'm going to close by presenting four different cases that will give you an example of how someone presents what type of testing we do, how we make the diagnosis and how we treat that patient. And obviously the treatment depends on the diagnosis as well as the patient's preferences and values. So here are all the signs and symptoms of a cardiac arrhythmia and they're listed alphabetically. So someone can be asymptomatic. It's very common to have a cardiac arrhythmia and not know it. You can have extra beats, you can have atrial fibrillation, you can have all types of arrhythmias and be unaware of it. And this is one of the reasons it's important to get an annual physical examination, particularly when you hit 50 years of age, because when you go in for that checkup feeling great, you may be found to have some type of arrhythmia condition. Cardiac arrest is another symptom of arrhythmia, and we've talked about that. Chest pain, you can get fluttering in your chest or chest discomfort. Uh, some arrhythmias affect cognitive functions, so confusion and memory loss. Uh, can be caused by arrhythmias. Fatigue is a very common cause of an arrhythmia. Heart failure, you can go into congestive heart failure due to an arrhythmia, or you can develop an arrhythmia because you have heart failure. You can have heart racing, heart fluttering, lightheadedness, palpitations, skip beats, extra beats, shortness of breath. A stroke can be a manifestation of a heart arrhythmia or you can pass out and wake up on your own. That's called syncope. That can be caused by arrhythmia. So there's lots of different symptoms that can be caused by a cardiac arrhythmia. So now let's take a step back and just think about the heart and think about the electrical system of the heart. So the heart's a pump and there are four chambers to the heart. So here's a, a drawing of a heart. You have what's called the superior vena cava brings blood from your head. The inferior vena cava brings blood from your legs into the right atrium, the right upper chamber of the heart. Then there's a valve that's shown here with these little strings attached. And this is the this is the right atrium. Blood goes into the right ventricle. It then gets squeezed out into the pulmonary artery. These the lungs are outside the heart, but this artery shoots the blood to the to the lungs. The lungs, the blood will pick up oxygen. It comes back through what's called the pulmonary veins to the left atrium, this structure of the heart, the left upper chamber. Then the blood goes to the left lower chamber, the left ventricle. And that's the big powerful pumping chamber that pumps it through the aorta. The aortic valve is shown here, shoots it out into the aorta to the body. And that's the structure of the heart and the heart is a pump. But it's important to realize, and I think most people don't really realize that the pump needs a timer, it needs a metronome to tell it how fast to beat, when to beat, and so forth. And that's what the electrical system is. So the body's pacemakers, the sinus node located in the upper right atrium, and there's cells in here that determine how fast the heart rate goes. And these cells are influenced by impulses of adrenaline or counter adrenaline. But this is what is your main metronome or determines your heart rate, whether you're resting or sleeping or running. The impulse then goes through the upper chamber cells to the AV node. The AV node brings the electricity from the upper chamber through these valves to the lower chamber where you have electrical wires or what's called the right bundle branch block and the left bundle, the left bundle. And these wires bring the impulse rapidly to the cells. The cells then contract, and that's sort of the normal functioning you know, of the heart in the electrical system. So here's an example. Actually, let me go backwards one beat. 
Here's an example of normal sinus rhythm. So I told you the sinus nodes in the right upper chamber, the right atrium, it, it stimulates the heart to squeeze. The heart squeezes from the right atrium to the right ventricle. And here's a normal EKG. And what you see is what's called the P wave. That's the upper chamber beating, the atria contracting. Then there's the PR interval, this little flat area when it goes through the AV node. And then the big thing is contraction of the ventricle. And then you have what's called the T wave when the heart recovers, and then it all happens again. Now, in normal sinus rhythm, it's a regular rhythm. You can see the intervals are spaced evenly. We all have a very regular pulse normally. And the rate is determined by what you're doing. If you're at rest or sleeping, the rate may be 50 beats a minute, 40 beats a minute, 60 beats a minute. But when you exercise, if you go on the treadmill and push yourself hard, you can get your heart rate up to 160, 170, 180. Your peak heart rate is to, is can be calculated by 220s minus your age. So when you're 20 years of age, you can get your heart rate to 200 beats a minute. But when you're 100 years of age, your body ratchets down where your peak heart rate's only 120 beats a minute. So the older you are, you gradually lower the heart rate and the, and the heart sort of designed to slow things down and make it easier on your heart over time. The heart rate, again, depends on sympathetic tone, vagal tone, basically whether you, you're, you're, if you're exercising, you call on your heart to bring more blood to the body, the heart rate goes up, more oxygen to the cells, and then you can exercise and so forth. So what is an arrhythmia? Well, an arrhythmia is when something goes wrong with the normal rhythm of the heart. The electrical impulse may happen too fast or too slow or erratically. A bradyarrhythmia is a slow heart rhythm. Generally, we say a bradyarrhythmia is when the heart rate is less than 60, but that can be normal if you're sleeping or resting. A tachyarrhythmia is when the heart beats too fast. Generally, we say over 100 beats a minute, but you can have sinus tachycardia when you're exercising, and that's, of course, normal. That's considered physiologic or normal. So there's an example of normal sinus rhythm. We've talked about that. So let's start out with types of arrhythmias. So the first one we're going to cover is atrial premature beats. And look first at this tracing I have on the screen. And here you have a normal beat of PQRS and a T wave, PQRS and T wave, PQRS and T wave. They're all very regular. Now you have this early beat. It comes before these other, you know, at an earlier interval. This is what you call, and there's a P wave before it, and it's skinny. So that's an atrial premature beat, an extra beat from the upper chamber. And usually these come where the stars from what's called the pulmonary veins. So, but they can come from anywhere in the upper chamber, can fire off an atrial premature beat. So these are these are very, very common, especially as you get older. It's uncommon for a newborn to have an atrial premature beat. But pretty much every 80-year-old I know has atrial premature beats, so it's partially age-related. A normal number is less than 500 per 24 hours. In a 24-hour period, we each have about 100,000 heartbeats. So normal number is 500 out of the 100,000 heartbeats being an atrial premature beat is considered normal. Now, you can feel them as an extra beat, a pause, a forceful beat. Or you may, or most people aren't even aware of them. You have an extra beat or you pick it up in a monitor, but you never feel it. But other people have something called cardiac awareness where they're very tuned in their heart and they have an extra beat and that causes them chest discomfort or they can feel in a skip beat, an extra beat, a pause, a forceful beat. Uh, so again, very, very common. So similarly, you can have extra beats from the ventricle. Here's a PVC, a normal beat, a normal beat. Here's an extra beat, but it's wide. The fact that it's wide tells you it's coming from the ventricle and not from the upper chamber. So uh, they, again, are common, normally less than 500 per day. A big number is like 10,000 a day or 20,000 a day. They can cause the same kind of symptoms as atrial premature beats. Extra beats, pauses, forceful beats, they're common. They may be a manifestation of, a heart, of heart disease or they may occur in a totally healthy, normal, uh, otherwise healthy person and be of no significance. So those are called PVCs. So now I'm gonna move on to atrial fibrillation. 
And atrial fibrillation is the most common type of sustained arrhythmia. It's the, really the most common and, the, and one of the most important cardiac arrhythmias. It's one I spend a lot of time uh, helping patients with. Atrial fibrillation occurs, it's like VF that we saw first, but it's VF of the atrium of the upper chamber. So these, this is the contraction of the upper chamber, these little tiny little squiggles at about 600 beats a minute. And the atrium is going crazy with impulses swirling around at 600, 800 beats a minute. They give, this makes the atrium beat super fast like VF. But in this case, we're, the lower chamber is protected by the AV node that acts like a filter. So the lower chamber in this patient is going about 100, but the atrium is going about five or 600. So this is atrial fibrillation. So it's a rapid, uh, erratically erratic rhythm. It's triggered from these pulmonary veins. The, that's where it mostly usually comes from. Symptoms include fatigue, heart racing, palpitations, lightheadedness, decreased exercise tolerance, or you may not be feeling any symptoms at all. AFib, something that starts to show up as age-related around the age of 50, more common in men than women, but it's common in both. By the time you're 80, one in 10 people have AFib. It's important because it increases stroke risk, gives you symptoms, increases chance of heart failure, dementia, mortality, so it's a very important arrhythmia and one there's been a lot of attention to increase in awareness. Now, Apple watches and things like that you can use to screen for arrhythmia. So a lot more AFibs being picked up, which is really great. Now, another arrhythmia to go over is atrial flutter. It's like AFib. It comes from the upper chamber, the atrium. But instead of being chaotic and super rapid, it is due to one short circuit in the atrium, usually in the right atrium over here. So if you look at the P waves, you see these little sawtooth P waves at about 300 beats a minute. That's the flutter waves. That's the upper chamber beating at 300 beats a minute. And then the big impulses are the ventricle, the lower chamber. The lower chamber beats once for every four upper chamber beats because that AV node acts like a filter. So again, atrial flutter is generally a regular rhythm, slower than AFib, but it's similar to AFib where it increases your stroke risk, can give you similar symptoms. Uh, but, but another difference is atrial flutter is very easy to treat with a simple ablation procedure where you cauterize a small one-inch segment of the heart and you can cure this quite easily. And again, as we go through, if you have questions, jot them down because we're covering a lot of material uh, in a short amount of time, but I just want to give you a sense of the spectrum of cardiac arrhythmias. Now, another arrhythmia, which you should be aware of, that actually is more common in women than men, is PSVT, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. This is a common upper chamber tachycardia. It's characterized by abrupt onset and termination. So one minute, your heart's beating normally, beat, 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 and then all of a sudden, the rate shoots up, beep, 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 to 160, 180, whatever. The heart rate is regular, rapid, and the rates vary between 100 and 200 beats a minute. When you get it, it can last for seconds or hours or days. It can stop on its own, or you may have to go to the emergency room and get an injection. It may terminate by bearing down what's called a Valsalva maneuver. And in women, it's very commonly misdiagnosed as a panic attack. A woman shows up and she says to the doctor, my heart is racing out of its, my chest. And the doctor says, well, dear, have you been under a lot of stress? How's your home life? Try some Valium. And so this is a very, very typical response. So it's very important for patients to be aware that it's not normal for your heart rate to abruptly start racing at 180 beats a minute and abruptly slow down. And if someone tells you it's a panic attack, you shouldn't believe them without checking with someone that's knowledgeable in arrhythmias, because it may be PSVT, which can cause you to pass out, get lightheaded, uh, uh, you know, or, or cause other, other problem, and it's easily curable with a procedure. Uh, so this is something to be aware of. Now, PSVT is due to one of three different arrhythmias. The most common is something called AV node reentry. Now, we talked before about the AV node, this pink structure. Some people have a second AV node or a second 
portion of the conduction system a little bit away from it. So there's two ways to get from the upper to lower chamber. Then the impulse can go down the extra part of it, what's called the slow pathway, up the normal pathway, spin around at 180, 200 beats a minute. And that gives you PSVT, which is a regular rapid rhythm. This is the most common cause of PSVT, two thirds. Most common in either you're as a teenager, young adult, or in middle life, like 40s, 50s, there's another peak. More common in women than men and easily curable with a simple outpatient procedure. Now, the second most common cause of PSVT is an accessory pathway where you're born with an extra muscle fiber connecting the upper and lower chamber. Again, these are the heart valves. And the only way for the impulse to get from the upper to lower chambers through the AV node in these wires, but some people have a piece of muscle left after they're born that causes a bridge. The impulse can then go down the normal pathway, up the extra pathway and back around and you get the same short circuit arrhythmia. It starts suddenly, stops suddenly, regular and rapid, but it's due to an accessory pathway. And that too is something we can go in there, find it, zap it and cure it very easily once you made the diagnosis. Now the third, this is about a third of patients. The third common cause of PSVT is a atrial tachycardia, irritability in the upper chamber. That's only one in a hundred. That's pretty uncommon. So I don't have a slide for that. So now we'll move on to ventricular tachycardia. We talked about atrial flutter being a short circuit in the upper chamber, making the upper chamber go at 300 beats a minute. Well, VT can be due to a short circuit or an irritable focus in the lower chamber causing the ventricle to go at between 100 and 300 beats a minute. Here's an example of ventricular tachycardia. In this case, it's wide, the impulse is wide, the EKG, it's rapid, it's coming from the lower chamber. It can be due to an irritable focus or a scar caused by a prior heart attack or inflammatory condition or a virus or something like that or it can be a runaway pacemaker, just some cells went crazy in the lower chamber, can occur in patients with heart disease or patients without heart disease, can make you feel lightheaded or pass out, it can cause you to have a cardiac arrest. Uh, the treatment depends on what's causing it and what kind of heart disease you have. Now, another problem you can have, we've talked about tachycardias, pretty much we've talked about tachycardias till now. There's also bradycardias. What causes the heart to beat slowly? And a normal slow heart rate, as I said, is usually your normal heart rate at rest is around 50 or greater. So if you have a heart rate, in this case, this patient, the heart rate's going 20 beats a minute. You can see there's a long distance between each beat. The heart rate's going 20 beats a minute. And if this occurs during the day while you're awake, and particularly if you have symptoms of lightheadedness or fatigue, this is due to the sinus node wearing out as you get older. And this can occur prematurely in people in their 60s or 70s. And this would be an indication for a pacemaker, a pacemaker you put in, and that can uh, replace the sinus node if you develop what's called sick sinus syndrome, sinus bradycardia. Again, very common as you get older, 70, 80, 90. Some people develop it prematurely in their 50s or 60s. Uh, it's not significant as slow heart rate if you're sleeping, but if you're awake and you have symptoms, that would be, and you're not on medicines that slow it down, that would be a reason to think about a pacemaker. Now, below, I show an example of heart, blo heart block. Here's a P wave, here's a P wave, here's a P wave, here's a P wave, here's a P wave. So the sinus node is working fine, but the lower chamber impulses, there's only two. So there's block, this one doesn't, you know, the, the impulses can't get from the upper chamber to the lower chamber because of heart block, this wire is broken. This is another common age-related condition. You can develop heart block. And if you get heart block, the treatment of that also is a pacemaker. So that's another type of bradyarrhythmia. And again, these are things that generally occur as you get older. Now, here's a really profound example. This is a patient we did a monitor on. And in the, on this monitor, there was a period where they had eight seconds and no heartbeat. So if you just don't breathe for eight seconds, you can see how that hard that is. Uh, usually you pass out after about five seconds with no heartbeat. So this patient has fairly dramatic sick sinus syndrome. And this patient, we put this monitor on because they were having lightheadedness. And again, they're in normal rhythm here. 
And then the impulse slows down, slows down, and then for eight seconds, not a single heartbeat. You could imagine what this would be like. So this patient was having lightheadedness. We did the monitor, made the diagnosis, put in a pacemaker. Now, this same patient also had this kind of thing seen on a monitor. Normal beat, normal beat. And then you have four extra beats, what's called atrial tachycardia, irritability in the upper chamber. And then you have a pause. Then all of a sudden you have a big pause before the body's pacemaker kicks in. This is called tachybrady syndrome. You get two blessings, heart going too fast, heart going too slow. Again, common as you get older, you treat the slow rhythms with a pacemaker, you treat the fast rhythms with medicines or a procedure. So there's all kinds of combinations of arrhythmias you can see in patients. Okay, so now that you're all experts on the normal heart's electrical system, the heart is a pump, all the different types of arrhythmias, let's see how good you are at figuring out a few patients. And I'm an electrophysiologist, so I deal with patients that have heart rhythm conditions or have been suspected to have heart rhythm conditions. So this is what I do all day long is see patients like this. So patient one is a 35-year-old woman who had passed out. She had collapsed suddenly, woke up on her own. Her physical examination was normal, but her family history was interesting that her father had died suddenly at the age of 35 years. Uh, he actually, at, at the age of 35. Now this is her EKG. So a typical next step for any patient you're seeing with an arrhythmia is to get an EKG. So an EKG, every time you see a cardiologist or an electrophysiologist, you're gonna get an EKG because it gives you a lot of information. Now we haven't gone over EKGs tonight, but take my word that this is an abnormal EKG and you have what's called inverted T waves in the precordial leads. These little T waves should be upright, they're inverted. So we got an EKG, that was abnormal. Uh, got an, a cardiac MRI, we put, we looked at the heart with an MRI, we did an EP study to see what arrhythmias we found. The MRI showed the right ventricle, the right lower chamber of the heart was really dilated. The EP study had multiple morphologies of ventricular tachycardia. Uh, we diagnosed her with a rare condition called ARVD, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which is a condition that athletes can get that's an inherited condition. And we recommended a defibrillator because she'd passed out suddenly. She had structural heart disease. This can be a setting for a cardiac arrest. We recommended a defibrillator. And sadly, the patient decided to put it off till the end of this. Well, we did an MRI showing this big right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. Usually the right ventricle is smaller than the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. It's enormous. And there's scar in the right ventricle. This is on the cardiac MRI. Again, you can see it here. The right ventricle is enormous. The left ventricle is smaller. Anyhow, sadly, she didn't have a get a defibrillator put in and she died suddenly about two months after I recommended that defibrillator. And on autopsy, the diagnosis of ARVD was confirmed. And this shows a heart, not of her, but of someone else who died of ARVD. And you can see the left ventricle, take my word for it, is structurally normal, but the right ventricle, the muscles gone from the cells and the chambers extremely uh, dilated and scarred. And so this is a condition called ARVD. This is a inherited cardiomyopathy. It's characterized by the muscle tissue of the heart being replaced by fat and scar and clinically by arrhythmias and increased risk of sudden death. And it's passed through families. So you can see families where the father, the daughter, the son had the cardiac arrest. Uh, so now we're gonna move on to case number two. 23 year old woman presents for evaluation of recurrent syncope. She too passed out. She has never injured herself. Her most recent episode occurred while standing in line at a store. She became warm, sweaty, and lightheaded. She then lost consciousness. She recovered, went to the local ER for evaluation. And when they were putting an IV in, her heart stopped for six seconds due to something called asystole. So you might initially say, well, she has six sinus syndrome and needs a pacemaker. But it would be most unusual for a 23-year-old girl to need a pacemaker. I told you it occurs in old people, not young people. Uh, so you so you should be sort of suspicious and a little slow to recommend a pacemaker in a young person. 
the implication of having a pacemaker for a lifetime is not insignificant. So she had syncope. Syncope is defined as a transient loss of consciousness due to transient global cerebral hyperfusion. It's basically when you pass out quickly and you come to spontaneously. So you're standing there one minute, you might feel dizzy or lightheaded, and then you collapse and you wake up on your own. And that's what's called syncope. Now, syncope is very common. It accounts for about 1% of hospital admissions, 3% of ER visits. It's very common in the elderly, 6%. About a third of the population, a third of everyone on this call will have syncope at some point in your life. But it's important to know it's common in the young, it's common in the old, but in the prime of life, and I consider myself in the prime of life, in your 40s, 50s, 60s, the incidence of a first episode of syncope when you're 50 or 60 years old is only about 6% over 10 years. So that's a patient of someone who's 55 has syncope that's unexplained, that may be a sign of arrhythmia where you need to look into that further. So this just shows the frequency of syncope. It's common when you're a teenager, young adult. It's rare when you're in the prime of your life. And as you get older, it starts to become more and more common. Now, syncope is important because if it's due to a cardiac cause, this is what's called the Kaplan-Meier analysis and looks at survival of patients with syncope. If you have syncope from an arrhythmia from your heart, your chance of having a cardiac arrest like that first patient is about 25% of a year. If you have syncope where you can't figure it out or it's not from your heart, you generally do quite well and it's not a life-threatening condition. So this is something that everyone should be aware of. Now, this shows the different types of syncope. You can have cardiac causes, vascular causes, neurologic causes, syncope of unknown origin. The most common cause of syncope is orthostatic or reflex-mediated. And, and I want to highlight what's called vasovagal syncope or the common faint. So vasovagal syncope, someone who's singing in choir in a church with hot lights in a hot robe and suddenly looks pale and white and feels nauseous and passes out and is sweaty, that's, and then they wake up and feel tired, that's vasovagal syncope. That's very common in young people. Orthostatic hypotension is when your blood pressure drops by more than 20 millimeters of mercury when you stand up. That's very common in elderly people. So if you're 70, 80, 90, and you're getting dizzy when you stand up, that's not normal. Check your blood pressure line, check it standing. And if the blood pressure drops by more than 20, you have a problem. And that's something that your doctor should be able to help you with. Now, arrhythmias can cause syncope. Arrhythmias can be too slow or too fast. They're like the third most common cause of syncope. Uh, and then sometimes you can't figure it out uh, uh, despite all the testing you do. So in this case, this young lady, we diagnosed vasovagal syncope. As I asked her more and more questions about when she passed out at the market, she said she felt warm and sweaty. Someone next to her said she was very pale and ghost-like. She passed out. She was exhausted when she came to. And when you have vasovagal syncope, if you're getting a blood drawn or an IV put in, that can trigger an episode and, and make the heart slow down or stop for a few seconds. And even though you have an urge to say, well, you must, the pacemaker's got to be the answer. The answer is pacemakers are not the answer. The answer is treating the condition with education. The patient should be explained what it is. You should make sure they increase their salt and fluid intake. That's all the treatment you need in most patients. There's some other medications you can use, and we try to avoid at all costs putting a pacemaker in particularly if someone's less than 45 or 50. But vasovagal syncope is very, very common. I'm sure many of you have experienced it maybe once, maybe many times. You may pass out all the way or almost faint, maybe triggered by seeing blood, something spooky, standing on a hot day, being dehydrated, and so forth. Now, the, while I'm... Okay, I'm going to keep m m moving. I'll talk to... There's one other kind of syncope while we're on it called postprandial syncope. Postprandial syncope is syncope that occurs several hours after the start of a meal. So you go out, it's Thanksgiving day, you have a big meal, you have some nice wine. And then about at the right is around when you're getting ready to come up, get up from the table, all of a sudden someone at the dinner table feels warm and sweaty and lightheaded. They pass out, slump over, you know, and then come to. That's what's called postprandial syncope. 
And if you have a history of a hypertension, you're a little bit elderly, a big meal, particularly with alcohol, can trigger it. And again, the blood goes to your stomach, the food goes to your stomach, the blood goes to your stomach, it doesn't go to your heart, you trigger the same kind of fainty reflex as vagal, vasovagal. If you have that, you just should learn to have you smaller meals or avoid alcohol, which can trigger it. Uh, case history number three, 55-year-old woman has palpitations for two years. She notes an irregular rapid pulse, otherwise healthy. So uh, one of the tests we like to do in patients with arrhythmia is, is called an event monitor. This is an example of an event monitor where we put this on, in this case, for two days and 10 hours. And it gives you information. It records every beat and tells you what arrhythmias you see. Now, the highlight of the arrhythmia is shown up here in this upper box. So you can see, you're all experts. This is a normal beat. This is a normal beat. And then all of a sudden, you see the beats are much more rapid than they were here with these first two beats or at the end. So this is what's called atrial tachycardia. It's skinny beats, it's from the upper chamber, it's rapid, this is atrial tachycardia. So, so this is what she has. Then if you look down here, it tells you more information. SVT beats, she didn't have many, less than 1%. I told you normally you have less than 1,000 a day or less than 1%. PVCs, she had a number of PVCs. And then we look a little bit further. This is one day, and this shows her heart rate on average and the peak heart rate, which can be very high. And every one of these little black dots is an episode of SVT. So she's having a mountain of SVT almost all the time. And here's an example, normal, normal, normal beat. And then she has SVT, normal beat, normal beat, PVC, normal beat. This is just a blow up of it showing a run of SVT, a run of SVT. Again, this is what's called atrial tachycardia. So she's diagnosed with atrial tachycardia. We've established a diagnosis based on that monitor. We do an echo, make sure it's normal. And this is a condition that's age-related, usually after the age of 50. And we usually start treatment with beta blockers and antiarrhythmic drugs. If that doesn't work, we can do a procedure. And then the final case is a 68-year-old man with hypertension and diabetes. He showed up for a routine physical examination, feeling great. He told his doctor how great he felt, and he's exercising five times a week on his Peloton. His physical examination is normal, except his pulse is irregular. So the doctor gets an EKG. Now, you're all experts at EKGs. I know you already have made the diagnosis. This shows atrial fibrillation. If you just look at this channel down here, you can see the impulses are irregular. They're spaced variably apart, and the upper chamber is going very, very fast. So he has atrial fibrillation, but he feels totally perfect. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to assess his stroke risk profile. We're going to put him on a blood thinner. We're going to set him up for a cardioversion to be shocked back to normal rhythm in three weeks. Uh, it takes three weeks for the blood thinner to kick in. Uh, he tells us he feels better after the cardioversion, either, even though he came in saying he had no symptoms. Once he was back to normal rhythm, he said, wow, I don't know what feeling good really was like. But over time, the AFib came back, and we ended up doing a procedure to cauterize the arrhythmia, and we treated it without medications, and he's doing well now. So a few words about AFib. It's very, very common. 12 million people have it, more common in the elderly. There's a one in four chance you'll get it at some point in your life. It's important for many reasons. It increases mortality by 1.3 to 3.5, of 1.3 to 3.5 increase in, in mortality, increased risk of stroke fivefold. It can cause heart failure, cognitive decline, depression, impair your quality of life, and, and result in you having to go to the hospital. So it's certainly an important arrhythmia that can cause a lot of bad things. We don't think about it as a life-threatening arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation, but patients with AFib don't live as long as patients without AFib, even when you correct for other differences like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and so forth. Uh, these are the risk factors for AFib. So genetics is a factor. It can run in your family. Age is the most important factor. Rare before 50, at 50 starts to show up. It's much more common in Caucasians than non-Caucasians, and it's more common than men than women. And these are other risk factors, hypertension, valve disease, heart failure, coronary disease, stress, 
too much alcohol, obesity, there's a big link between obesity and AFib, sleep apnea, smoking, and so forth. There's also data on body height and body size. The taller you are, the more likely you are to get AFib, and the bigger you are. So if you're six foot eight and you weigh 500 pounds, very high chance you're going to get AFib. If you're five foot four and weigh 100 pounds, very unlikely you're going to get AFib. Treatment of AFib, just a few words. You start out by making the diagnosis. First thing you want to prevent strokes. You want to assess their stroke risk profile. Give them a blood thinner if they're high risk. Then you want to talk about whether you want to get them back to normal rhythm or not. And generally, we try to do that with medications or procedures. If we can't get them back to normal rhythm, we can slow it down. And then we always want to think about risk factor modification, losing weight, cutting down alcohol, controlling the blood pressure. To treat AFib, we do what's called AFib ablation. This is how I spend most of my time. I told you AFib comes from these pulmonary veins. You can freeze around the veins or you can burn around the veins like a ring of pearls. This is a very commonly performed procedure today. So let me just conclude that arrhythmia is an abnormal rhythm of the heart. They can cause faster, slower, or regular heartbeats. There are many symptoms of an arrhythmia and the same arrhythmia can give a wide range of symptoms. Symptoms vary from none at all to fatigue, to syncope, to sudden death, to stroke, to dementia. It's important for individuals to be aware of their heart weight. You know, you should know your heart's a pump, but you should generally have a concept that it's, it, it's supposed to beat regularly. If it seems to be too fast, too slow, or irregularly, an evaluation may be needed. Increasingly, there's handheld consumer products like the Apple Watch or something called the Cardio device, a live core monitor where you can check your heart rate or you can get a stethoscope and listen to it or you can check your pulse and your wrist. Rhythmic evaluations can be performed by cardiologists or electrophysiologists like me. Electrophysiologists are the electricians of the heart and there are many treatments for rhythmia, including reducing stress and alcohol, pacemakers, and plentiful defibrillators and medications. This just shows us a work in what's called an EP lab with our computers, uh, evaluating the electrical system. We thread the wires in through your leg up to the heart like this, and then hook you up to the computer. Uh, we can cauterize arrhythmia. This is an extra muscle fiber we're cauterizing. This is treating atrial fibrillation. Here's a what's called a bifascicular, I mean, a dual, a, a resynchronization therapy pacemaker. So this is a pacemaker. Here's a defibrillator. So there's lots of, of, of things we can do to make arrhythmias better. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Calkins. Whoa, great information, lots of information, wonderful. So we're gonna just jump right to the questions. How about that? Because we've got quite a few. Okay, great. As much as I'd like you to take a breath, you're not going to have that opportunity. So, <laughs> so here we go. Our first question is from Tasha, and she would like to know, are there differences in arrhythmias in men versus women and also in people of color? So the answer is yes, there are differences in the incidence of arrhythmias in men versus women. The, you know, the most I think one of the more common examples is atrial fibrillation. As I just mentioned, it's more common in men than women, more common in Caucasians than African-Americans. So certainly gender and race do matter, particularly for some arrhythmias. Uh, sudden death, I don't think there's any, uh, I mean, there's gender differences in sudden cardiac death where generally men have higher risk of sudden cardiac death. Men are more likely to get coronary artery disease. They're more likely to have uh, you know, sudden death related to coronary artery disease. They're more likely to have a prior heart attack. So I think... In general, you know, men don't live as long as women because they are, are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease, including hypertension, AFib, sudden death, you know, heart attacks, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So, uh, following that question, so once you're quote treated, you know, are you cured, or is there something that needs to be managed throughout your lifetime? So, if you you know you have these arrhythmias, you go in your doctor like yourself, takes care of them. Is that it? Can they, Or can they come back? Yeah, so some arrhythmias are curable and some are, are treatable but not curable. It's more like cancer and remission. So examples of curable arrhythmias are PSVT, that arrhythmia where you go ahead and have an extra circuit and you cauterize an area. Mm -hmm. That's a curative, curative procedure. You go have that procedure. If you don't, if it doesn't come back in the next six months, you're cured for life, you, you know, it's gone. 
Perfect. So some arrhythmia is like PSVT, AV node reentry, accessory pathways, Wolf Parkinson White, you're, you can be cured of with a procedure. But other arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, we never use the word cure. We're treating it. We're controlling the AFib. We're putting it in remission. But AFib is age-related. So as you get older, it's always trying to come back. And in general, of people that have had an ablation procedure and are doing well a year later, if you look out five years, AFib will come back in one in four. Now, it's more likely to come back if you're obese. It's more likely to come back if you drink a lot of alcohol and so forth. But but AFib is, a, is an arrhythmia where we never use the word cure. We use the word control. I see. Yep. Makes sense. So would that mean, uh, are there any effects, environmental uh, factors or lifestyle? Well, you did talk about lifestyle as far as obesity and drinking and things like that, you know, what? Uh, Perhaps over well, in terms of environmental, there's actually a lot of data saying mm -hmm. that hot, humid weather increases the risk of a cardiac arrest. So there's been epidemiologic studies done around the world that if it's really hot and humid, you see more cardiac arrest than if it's not. And cardiac arrests are more likely to occur in the morning than later in the day. So certainly the environment pollution, the risk of cardiac arrest goes up if there's heavy pollution than if there's not heavy pollution. It's sort of amazing all the work that's been done uh, looking at that. So certainly environment and, and, and weather temperature does play a role. That's interesting. Would that also be the same effect if you were living or vacation or whatever in a cold that was you know really severely cold? No, I've never seen any data saying that cold weather increases arrhythmias. So there's never been a study you know, that people in Alaska have more arrhythmias. Somehow cold is good, but hot, humid weather, particularly with high pollution, is bad. Interesting. So your blood pressure doesn't drop just because you're in cold weather, which could lead to oh, yeah. one of these arrhythmias. Yeah. Yep. Um, good to know. Um, so... Our next question is from Lois, and she would um, like to know, so what can we do to help prevent AFib? Is there anything that we can do? So yes, there's lots you can do. The first thing you can do is to have a normal body mass index, is try to stave off obesity. Mm -hmm. And generally, there's lots of data that's come out, mainly from Australia. If you take a pig and send them to the sheep and send them to the smorgasbord and they get fat, they'll get AFib. And then if you put them on a diet and take them away from the smorgasbord and they get skinny again, the AFib will disappear. Where well, their studies have shown the same thing in people. You could take someone having a lot of AFib, you get the weight off and the AFib will melt away. Not necessarily 100%, but it helps a lot mm -hmm. getting that weight off. When you're overweight, you know, the pressures in the heart go up, the heart thickens, inflammation in the heart goes up, fat outside the heart increases and fat outside the heart causes inflammation of the heart that can trigger AFib. So the biggest thing you can do to stave off AFib is to maintain a normal body mass index. Usually we say less than 27. You can go on and look at the body mass index calculator, see how you're doing. Mm -hmm. The second thing you can do is to avoid excessive alcohol. There's been more and more data recently that even a glass of wine or a beer will statistically increase your risk of AFib the next day or two after you have that drink. Now, for most people, the risk is, is almost nothing and doesn't make any difference. Doesn't seem to be any correlation. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you can't have a glass of beer or a glass of wine or whatever. But there's lots of data saying that if you get wildly intoxicated, you know, holiday heart syndrome, you know, New Year's Day, lots of people show up in ERs with AFib triggered by alcohol, which in high levels are direct toxins. So two, be careful about alcohol. Three, you want to maintain your blood pressure in a normal range, I think would be a third thing. The other, one of the other interesting things is exercise. So it's good to be active and it's good to exercise, but it's not good to do endurance sports. So marathons, triathlons, all that kind of super, super endurance sports, all the data says those people, even though they're super skinny and other and have a very low fat index and all the rest of it, they have a lot more arrhythmias than people that are not elite athletes. So, you know, at the extremes, it's never good. It's not good to be an elite athlete. I mean, if you love it from an endorphin high, do it by all means, but no, don't think you're helping your heart from a, a cardiovascular standpoint or certainly from an arrhythmia standpoint. 
uh, you know, you know, I, you know, the normal, you know, the AHAs is 20 to 30 minutes, three to four times a week. It's sort of all the, you get maximum benefit from a much lower amount of exercise. And once you push the scale, I mean, you can imagine if you're running your heart fast and hard for our hundreds and hundreds of hours, you just wear it out. The chambers stretch, they scar, you get it more AFib, you get more sudden death. So anyhow, that's sort of, you know, an interesting thing that a lot of people aren't aware of. That is an excellent explanation of exercising. Really great. Thank you so much for that. Because you're right, there's not very many people that that know that. They think, you know, more is more, as opposed to, as opposed to not necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So let's move on. So Joy wants to know, are we seeing more patients having new arrhythmias after COVID infections? Yes, absolutely. COVID. I've seen lots of patients that have, have arrhythmias after COVID infection, and I've seen many patients where they get a vaccination, and that seems to, a lot of patients seem to say that seems to suggest there's an association both between COVID and maybe even between a vaccination. Now, if patients ask me, does that mean I should not get a vaccination? The answer is absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's crystal clear that COVID can trigger AFib. Anything that causes stress, poor sleep can trigger AFib. High fever can trigger AFib. So I think COVID triggers a lot of AFib. I personally think a vaccination helps prevent AFib, but I've had patients that are convinced it was that vaccination. I can't say that I've that I believe that to be true, but I know for sure that COVID can trigger AFib. So it's best to avoid getting COVID by getting vaccinated and so forth. So will it correct itself? It may or may not. You, you, you know, I mean, and generally, you know, once the COVID is resolved, you think the trigger is going to melt away and it won't be a big issue. So I think it will tend to resolve on its own. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer wants to know, what tools do you use to identify the location of the particular cells that are misfiring, that is basically causing the arrhythmia? Well, we determine that both, we start out by looking at the EKG and seeing where the extra beads seem to be coming from. But then we do an EP study. At the end, I showed some pictures of an EP lab where we thread catheters into the heart and we have a 3D GPS mapping system. So we have, we measure the activation of the heart at thousands of different places to figure out wherever the earliest, where the heartbeat's coming from, the abnormal beats coming from, you track it down. And then once you track it down, you take a catheter and you cauterize those rogue cells to, to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty sophisticated field. I mean, you know, the, the, the field of electrophysiology and catheter ablation is really, developed over the last 30 to 40 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, thank you. Uh, so Dr. Calkins, Bill wants to know, is a strong heartbeat, um, it can count directly by, by feeling your heart, and a rate elevation, though not greater than 100, a type of arrhythmia? Right. It's a strong. Uh, yeah, most patients that tell me, I mean, patients come in and they say, oh, I have a forceful or a pounding or strong heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Then I'll ask them, well, can you tap it out? You know, how fast does it go? And if they're, if the heartbeat is somewhere between 60 and 100, most likely that's just due to what's called cardiac awareness, where, you know, I think most of the people on this call, you don't even realize your heart's beating once a second or whatever else, not once, you know, well, you know, you know 60 times a minute you know, you, you know, you just don't realize that your heart's in there working away all the time. Right. But some people have cardiac awareness where they can sort of feel their heart in their chest. And what they generally say, it feels like it's beating really, really hard and forceful. With arrhythmias, it's usually, if it's a, a tachyarrhythmia, a fast arrhythmia, it's usually fast and weak because you're, you know, the the impulses are fast. The amount of blood in the heart is less per beat. So you're actually, you're, you have a softer, pulse, a rapid pulse, but it's weaker if you're feeling at the wrist or something like that. So mm -hmm. I think generally someone who says I have a really, four, you know, and if someone says oh, I have palpitations, I say, what do you mean by palpitations? Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it regular? Is it irregular? Is it forceful? Is it weak? And if they say, well, it's forceful and it's about at 70 beats a minute, 
you, you know, and they, you know, that most likely is just cardiac awareness. A little bit of adrenaline will make your heart beat a little bit faster. Or just thinking about your heart rate will increase adrenaline. Your heart will beat stronger. Your blood pressure will go up and you'll sort of feel that. And that can be an uncomfortable feeling for some person, people, but it's not anything to be concerned about. Right. But, yeah. but one of the things which I forgot to mention with any arrhythmia, the key to diagnosis is a, is a, is a symptom rhythm correlation, meaning you want to catch the fox in the hen house. So when we put these monitors on patients for two weeks, we're hoping they'll experience their symptoms. And then we could say like in that patient I showed you at the end who was having the palpitations and we put the monitor on, we saw the atrial tachycardia. Mm -hmm. So if you have the monitor on, they push the button, they're having their symptoms. You know, you might look at the monitor and the rhythm's perfectly normal. Then you know their symptoms are not related to an arrhythmia. Or you may find a PVC or an atrial premature beat or VT or all sorts of things. So you, so in people that have arrhythmias, symptoms fairly frequently every day, every week, every month, you can usually put on a monitor and catch it. <clears throat> if they only have one a year, there's monitors we can put under the skin for three years. And even if it happens once a year, we can catch it. And then sometimes we have to go and do our EP study and see if we can stir it up and figure it out that way. Wow. So with that though, I mean, that would, that you would get a procedure like that done if, if, if your doctor was really concerned, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you, you had an arrhythmia, this, if you well, had an arrhythmia and you couldn't, it's so infrequent, you couldn't catch it on a monitor. Mm -hmm. It's worrisome with heart racing or whatever. The next step would be to do an EP study where you go check out the electrical system with these catheters. Right. It's a pretty small, I mean, you run a few catheters up, it's outpatient. It's not a big deal. Uh, but usually we can catch, we can diagnose it from these monitoring devices or someone will get an Apple watch or this alive core monitor or whatever. Right. Right. Great. Well, with that, Sarah wants to know, so if you have PVCs, so kind of the benign, you know, benign ones, she wants to know um, if you have a lot of them or um, will that, are you more susceptible then to severe arrhythmias or die from cardiac arrest? Uh uh, the answer is, uh, if you have a huge amount of PVCs, so one, PVCs generally either are what's called idiopathic. They either occur in a structurally normal heart. So you're a young, healthy person, you have PVCs, the PVCs come one place. It's just due to an irritable, irritable focus. That's not a life-threatening condition that will increase your risk of sudden death or shorten your life, but it can give you symptoms and you mm -hmm. can treat it with medicines or a procedure. Uh, so that's that's one thing. If you have PVCs and you have structural heart disease, you have scar in your heart, you've had a heart attack, you have cardiomyopathy, that would be something that would suggest a higher risk. If you have ARVD, that inherited condition I showed you, the more PVCs you have, the higher the risk of an arrhythmia. So we use that to determine whether to put an implantable defibrillator in. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is if you have a monstrous amount of arrhythmias, let's say you have 40% PVC, so every other beat of your heartbeat is an extra beat. In some people, that can cause a cardiomyopathy. It can weaken your heart, and you want, you'll treat it even if they have no symptoms because to prevent their heart from getting weaker. So there's a, anyhow, there's all different types of arrhythmias. Some are benign, some are dangerous, some can cause heart failure, some can't. Mm -hmm. It's a big field. Yeah, thank you. So Julia wants to know, so... Um, she said, how does thyroid affect the heart? She's been experiencing lots of palpitations and change of medicine seems to have helped it. So not only um, thyroid, but if you have other conditions that could cause, you know, arrhythmias, that, that, that it's not your yeah, heart no, actually no. causing it, no, it's anyhow. something else that's causing it. Yeah. So the I answer mean, is that particularly hyperthyroidism, a high thyroid is a very common cause of arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's diagnosed with AFib, one of the tests you always do right out of the box is to get thyroid function tests to check the thyroid because that's an important treatable reversible cause of atrial fibrillation. Now, low high thyroid, less so, but hyperthyroid is a, is a is common cause of arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation. Uh, other endocrine conditions, I mean, uh, Diabetes obviously increases risk of heart attack and arrhythmias and stroke risk from AFib. Uh, so there's other links, but I think the most classic is is uh, is hyperthyroidism. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. We have about uh, a minute. 
uh, before we have to get to my little piece and then end. So uh, question. So when you, uh, from Sarah, she wants to know uh, about magnesium supplements. Can they help with palpitations? Is there any, and or anything else that can help with palpitations as, as far as a supplement? So uh, it's certainly if someone has a low magnesium, is hypomag has a low magnesium, usually people that are on diuretics or things like that, mm -hmm. that can increase susceptibility to arrhythmias, particularly if you have something called long QT syndrome, which is an inherited iron condition, can iron channel condition. So certainly low ma hypomagnesemia can be proarrhythmic, as can a low potassium and whatever. Right. Uh, whether if you have a normal magnesium, I generally don't recommend magnesium supplementation, but some of my patients have do it and find it to be helpful. I'm not aware of a lot of scientific data saying it makes a huge difference, but it's certainly not dangerous. Uh, so I have some patients that do it, but it's not something I often prescribe. Well, thank you. Listen, uh, Dr. Calkins and everyone, I'm so sorry we're approaching the eight o'clock hour and um, we can't thank you, Dr. Calkins, enough for speaking with us this evening. And uh, Dr. Calkins has graciously agreed to respond to any of the unanswered questions that were asked this evening. So in a couple of weeks, you'll receive an email outlining the outstanding questions and answers. And in the coming weeks, a video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey under videos on demand. And if you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey for more information about upcoming webinars, our Insights That Matter podcasts, and sign up for our monthly emails. Thank you so much. Good night and stay well. Thank you.